I think while we wait, maybe we should take the opportunity uh, to thank the local organizers. So Tiziana is here, Alba there, Vito, Michael Angelo. You are going to have the chance to applaud uh, Stuart and Roberta who are going to speak now, but I think they did a, a great job uh, organizing this symposium for us. And uh, then we can start. I'd like to welcome uh, everybody online. Uh, this is the last session of uh, the CTAO symposium uh, in which we are going to see sort of a review of everything that was uh, said here along this week and also uh, the next steps the, that the CTAO is going to follow. We start uh, with the project scientists. So Roberta Zanin is going to speak about uh, the science to be done with CTAO. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good morning, everybody. So I have been asked to talk about uh, CTO uh, for doing science, so using CTO, sorry, for science. And you may be wondering uh, why you have a boat as, as a first slide, but I promise I will be talking about uh, uh, c using CTA for, for science. So uh, when I was preparing this talk, uh, I changed the title, and now the title is, uh, is actually the title of a book that uh, uh, reads, uh, Will it make the boat go faster? So the, the story of this book starts in, uh, in 1996 in Atlanta, at the Olympic Games, there was an Englishman. This, this Englishman was part of a, an eight-man um, rowing team that arrived eighth at the Olympic Games. And there he was pissed, and he decided that he could have won the gold medal once in a life. And, uh, and he convinced uh, his teammates that, uh, that in Sydney, four years later, they would have won the, the gold medal. And then they needed, so the goal was clear, four years gold medal, but the, uh, so they need a strategy to reach that goal. And the strategy was for four years to ask themselves before starting and performing any action in their life, asking this question, will it make the boat go faster? So if the answer would have been yes, then this action could, could actually happen. If the answer was no, then this action was not uh, possible. And this was applied to any kind of action in their life, from uh, shall I go to visit my mother, yes or no, or shall I eat uh, a burger or a vegetable? So this was really their strategy for four years. So now, the, I have been asked to prepare the, uh, the mid-period plan, scientific plan, so mid-period for us, for our observatory, means four years, uh, sorry, three years ahead. So more or less the time target is the same, and uh, our goal would be to have, uh, at the end of these three year science with CTAO. So we need CTAO data, and uh, we would, like to have, so the goal would be to have uh, an array of telescopes uh, that would perform better than what we have now, so the current uh, generation of ICTs. So with this in mind, that, uh, uh, so I, I did this plan, and I think it is, it is actually a realistic plan, but it is realistic only if all of us will behave scientifically, will, will act scientifically speaking uh, in the same way, using the same strategy, asking ourselves, uh, will it make the boat go faster? And when I say everybody, I don't mean only us as scientists, but also IKC contributors uh, and funding agency. But it's, it's realistic uh, if, if we all uh, go for it. So let's start uh, with the, where we are. Now, so uh, after uh, a week of, uh, uh, no, no, not a week, three days of, uh, of symposium, you know already that, uh, that CTAO is, is a distributed facility with four sites. And, uh, and what we have now is, uh, you heard about it, an LST, so a CTA prototype doing science already in La Palma. We have a nice desert with a road in the south. 
we have uh, an almost finished uh, building uh, that will be hosting the SDMC, so the Science Data Management Center in Zoyten, and we have quite some people. So this, this picture is, is from the CTAO staff, but it's just a representation of uh, the, the all of us uh, that are here to build the uh, CTAO. And, uh, and we want to arrive to this point, so to have uh, two uh, fully equipped array in the, in the alpha configuration, we want to have, we need to have also the operational buildings. You have there two renderings, one for the north and uh, one for the north and one for the south. And we have, and we want to have also the final, well, this is complicated, a final uh, uh, SDMC uh, building that will actually be inaugurated in October this, this year. So for, from the scientific point of view, buildings are less uh, interesting. Let's, let's. But uh, what we want to focus on are the arrays. So we heard a lot in these days that, that uh, our initial goal is the alpha configuration that foreseen. So these are the layouts that have been uh, defined after a Doro study, optimization study. So we will have a four LST and nine MST in the, at the northern side in La Palma and uh, 14 MSTs and 37 SSTs in, uh, in the southern. Uh, uh, at the southern side. But, uh, I mean, I will stall now a quotation from Regina. The, this morning we are already, we are capable of holding two ideas in mind at the same time and still functioning. So we have already start, uh, started to think about upgrades of these, uh, of these alpha configuration. And we heard before me that we have uh, R&D studies of different kind of, of telescope, telescope prototypes. But what I will be talking about is something really realistic for which we have already funds. And uh, it's realistic at the point that uh, tenders have been already um, uh, published, released. So this, this uh, what I'm talking about is uh, uh, actually an upgrade, an improvement of the alpha configuration that is dealing more with only with the southern array and it foresees uh, the addition of two LSTs and, uh, and five SSTs. You may be wondering why I don't give a name to this configuration that uh, I can already spoil it will be called beta configuration with no fantasy, but uh, I didn't put it clearly because uh, there is no yet an official uh, council statement about this. This is a formality, so all this, uh, uh, so this will happen and uh, it's just a matter of formality of, uh, about the name. So for the first time I present uh, the, uh, officially the, uh, the sensitivity of this improved uh, alpha configuration. And you see here that uh, so this is uh, the sensitivity as a function of the energy. The, the purple line that you will be seeing in all the plots is, uh, is actually an, uh, the average sensitivity of the current uh, IACTs array. So it's, it's a line that we have estimated by taking the sensitivity of magic S and Veritas, and uh, I will be using these uh, just as a reference instead of plotting three lines every, every time. So you see here that, uh, and this is the ratio, here you have the sensitivity ratio, so the higher the better, and you see here uh, that the improvement uh, of these improved alpha configuration with respect to the alpha configuration is mainly as we expect at the low energies. So we have uh, up to 20% at uh, 500 GV and there is uh, almost 80% uh, uh, improvement at the lowest energies thanks to the additional of these two large size telescopes. Uh, this also translates in, a, in an improvement uh, in the angular resolution uh, up to this, uh, the same energy molest, 500 GV. So we, we are not only working in improving uh, the final goal, so the alpha configuration uh, or the performance of these uh, uh, alpha configuration in terms of telescopes, uh, but also in terms of software reconstruction. So I want to point out uh, that, that uh, we have decided, learning from the experience uh, and of, uh, of Fermilat, uh, we have decided uh, to include in our uh, uh, construction plan from the very beginning uh, the use of uh, event types. 
So for those that are familiar with Fermi, this is a very f uh, common concept. For the others, this means that we reconstruct uh, the events and we categorize them according to the quality of their reconstruction. And each category, then uh, usually we define four categories, uh, and each category is analyzed independently, and then uh, the likely, then the, it, they are combined at the later stage uh, with a likelihood fit. And this has been proven in Fermilat uh, that improved the sensitivity in the all energy range between 20 and 50 percent. So this is a slide. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is a slide that I stole from uh, Luca Baldini. It was presented at TEFPA in 2024. And this is the uh, preliminary result uh, in a poster by Juan Bernabete that, uh, that you, can, you can have a look uh, and you see that, uh, that already in these preliminary results uh, we have the 20% improvement uh, in, uh, in sensitivity. So this is something that we are working on both on in terms of implementation and optimization of, of the algorithms. Uh, as we, as it, it, it is true for the telescopes that there are a lot of R&D activities in parallel, it's true, it's true also from the software point of view. So here uh, I want to point out one of the posters that we saw yesterday. So this is, uh, uh, there, there is room for improvement of performance, especially important at the level of the angular resolution. So these, these guys, the George is, is uh, using a hybrid, uh, hybrid likelihood and machine learning uh, algorithm. Uh, and here you have, uh, uh, here you have uh, the improvement uh, in, uh, in the angular resolution. So you have three uh, methods of uh, reconstruction, the standard HILAS, impact, and free pact, which is what he is working on. So the, the, these two, HILAS and impact, uh, are already planned and will be implemented in the, in the pipeline, reconstruction pipeline. Uh, and this is an R&D work. And I want to just uh, this, this plot, uh, more than from the, uh, for the absolute numbers, what is relevant is the, uh, the relative difference between uh, uh, free pact and impact in terms of angular resolution, which is at the level of uh, 20%. I think it's so one of the of the strengths of CTAO is uh, as we saw also this morning uh, in Ulysses talk is the uh, is the angular resolution. So we should really do all what we can to to keep uh, to try to have to to improve the angular resolution down to the limit of what this technique allows. I mean this this has uh, a high impact for science. Uh, this is what will allow us to to really dig into the science and identify which are the pervatrons. And for instance, uh, just, just as an example, we talked about this two days ago. So this is really, uh, here I have another example. This is an exercise we did with uh, Enrique Emma a few years ago. Uh, this is the Crab Nebula, it's a simulation. This, this is the template that we took from the, uh, from the X-rays. This is the simulation if we use what we estimate, so using the, the, um, the angular resolution that is in the requirements at the moment. And this is what we would like to arrive to get with CTA, but this would, in, would need an improvement with respect to the requirement of a factor four. So this is... Uh, an, uh, an ambitious goal that we need to, uh, to keep working uh, to, to, to achieve. We are also uh, deeply uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, well, we are, we are working deeply on the hard uh, in, uh, in keeping the systematic uncertainty under control. One of the, of the um, most constraining performance, science performance requirement uh, is actually that those, well, are, are more than one, so are those on the, uh, on the systematic uncertainty. One of the main uh, sources of these systematic uncertainty is our atmosphere. So there is a huge effort going on, and here I want to thank Georgios and Marcus mainly, the, uh, to, to try to study in a systematic way 
all the, and to, to quantify the sources, the effect of the, the different sources of systematic uncertainty. Here I give just one example. So in uh, uh, the, the molecular density profile, which is something that is included in our simulations, and uh, uh, it, it, it has, it shows uh, the seasonal variations. Uh, here you see this is something, this is in La Palma, so it's for the northern side, is something that, uh, that the magic people, or those that have worked in La Palma, Knows, knows very well, and, uh, and uh, it's clear that we need, uh, if we want to maintain uh, this systematic uncertainty within the 2%, we need to simulate, to define not one molecular density profile, but three, and then changing the molecular density profile in our simulation accordingly to the value of these, uh, um, uh, of these uh, uh, quantity that we can retrieve from the ACMWF, which stands for the European, Certain Me European Center Midterm Weather Forecast. Uh, so this is uh, something uh, that, uh, that we are explore exploring now, and uh, we need to actually compute the accuracy and precision of these data. And, uh, and for this, uh, one of the efforts that we are uh, uh, following is that uh, we, we participate uh, into an atmospheric characterization campaign that is organized by ISO for the, uh, for the southern side. So the southern side for us is the one that, uh, that is less characterized because we, have, we don't have uh, the, the experience of magic there. And, uh, and for us, this campaign is extremely important and will help us in all this exercise of trying to quantify the systematic uncertainty. So up to now, I have talked mainly about uh, simulation and preparation for the, uh, for the um, alpha configuration or the, uh, or the future beta uh, configuration, so our final goal. But uh, I started the talk uh, saying that we will be, I will be talking about using CTAO for science, and we have a mid-period goal that is around uh, uh, three, uh, three years. And uh, this mid-period mid goal has to deal with, uh, with data. So we saw already that we, there are some data that comes from the prototype. Uh, these I will refer to talks uh, that we had in the, during these days uh, by David Green and, Dave, and Daniel Morquende. There are also nice posters. Uh, this, this, the LST collaboration has published an excellent uh, performance paper and also the first, uh, the first uh, um, scientific uh, uh, paper we have seen uh, the detection of the first, uh, uh, well, well, the second farthest away sources. So the, the, the science is really coming out from the first prototype, but what we want is the science with CTAO. So here, uh, the, the, the concept to reach this, this mid-period goal uh, is uh, to define intermediate array configuration. So what are, the, uh, what are they? So we have incremental array configuration that becomes progressively uh, operative. So it's, it's uh, um, so the, the input of this uh, of these plan that I have uh, done to arrive to define the intermediate configuration is based on uh, the construction schedule that, uh, that has been built accounting for the input from the, uh, the in-kind contributors. So both from the hardware side, so the telescope team, but also on the, on the software side. So these, when I talk about intermediate array configuration, I'm talking about uh, configuration that includes uh, array elements, so both the telescope but also um, calibration devices, atmospheric characterization devices, uh, and, uh, um, and, and also software packages, so the intermediate release of software packages. So it's a fully integrated uh, system, let's say, in, uh, in this intermediate array configuration. So we, on, we don't only want to have uh, uh, inter data, but we also want to have uh, data that have a scientific impact. So here the exercise uh, we have been doing. So you see the, in this plot uh, that you have uh, the on-axis sensitivity ratio. So it's a sensitivity 
computed with respect to the sensitivity of these uh, current uh, array IECT arrays. So if, uh, if this value is larger than one, then we are better than the current ICT arrays. Otherwise, we don't. And this is uh, computed as a function of the energy. Why this? Because each telescope type is optimized for a different energy range. So I cannot give just one. Uh, one, uh, one value, one global value. And here, uh, keeping into account uh, the inputs uh, of the construction schedule, uh, um, I have defined what, uh, which kind of set of telescope uh, gives me the sensitivity, on axis sensitivity, that is better than what we have now, so with the current ICTs array. So you see, for instance, that a 40 GV uh, with two LSTs, uh, we are a factor three better than, uh, uh, than the current uh, uh, IACTs arrays. Uh, for the, in the range between 100 and 1 TV, uh, we had two LSTs uh, and, uh, and one MSTs, uh, so we, have, uh, uh, we are more or less at a factor two. And then uh, for the highest energies, uh, then SSTs uh, becomes relevant. Uh, and here you have uh, the five SSTs uh, configuration. So if you are wondering why I have uh, set, so for instance, why I'm considering only one MSTs and I didn't consider more than, than, uh, than one, it, it is because it comes from the input of the construction schedule. So what we can actually realistically have within this, uh, these three years. Another message that I want, uh, I want to convey, so this is done for the on-axis sensitivity. I have been doing also for the, for the angular resolution. Uh, so the, basically, the, the message is, is that we can have 40% uh, uh, improvement with respect, up to 40%, sorry, improvement uh, with respect to the current IECTs arrays. But uh, it's, it's very clear that the high impact results that we can have uh, at the end of this uh, mid-period, at the end of these three years, uh, shall focus on science cases uh, that need sensitivity more than angular resolution. So now, end of this three-year period, we are in uh, 2027. So uh, now I will show you what uh, we can have in uh, 2027 uh, in the north and then in, uh, in the south. So for the northern array, uh, we would, uh, the, 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 the plan would be to have four LSTs and one MSTs. And you have there the, uh, the layout that in this case is pretty defined. And you see here the plot, the same plot as before. So in uh, this, uh, this purple line is the usual uh, three third generation, so current generation of ICTs arrays. Then we have in black uh, the, the performance of these uh, intermediate configuration that uh, includes four LSTs and one MSTs, and how this compares uh, with the existing uh, um, instruments uh, in the same energy range that are not necessarily IACTs arrays. So we have Astri in this case, that is this gray line. Then Lazo, we heard about this, and Hawk uh, five-year sensitivity. So you see what is, is important to convey. This is the on-axis sensitivity. So this, the, I mean, the, the, the field of view, the gamma ray field of view of this intermediate array is around uh, three uh, degrees. The, um, the, what is important to convey is that uh, already with this uh, configuration, we are, uh, uh, we are beating the current uh, generation of ICT up to uh, several uh, TVs. The, in terms of angular resolution, uh, so we are at 0 0.1, uh, uh, sorry, 0 0.06 uh, uh, degrees uh, at most uh, at, at 10 TV, but what is relevant is the low energies, uh, so around one, 0 0.1 degrees. The, the message I want to convey, so this, this, is, this intermediate configuration will have uh, one performance parameter that is basically um, the, the, what we will have with the full configuration. So it's really where uh, we will not lose science uh, already with this uh, intermediate configuration, which is uh, the capability, so the sensitivity for short uh, uh, observing time. So you see, this is the, uh, the, the official plot uh, of the sensitivity, differential sensitivity as a function of the time. And you see, and this is compared for different energies, so the different lines are different uh, energies between uh, 25 GV and 200 GV, and this compares with Fermilat, so it's the, the 
because it's, it's the instrument uh, with the overlapping energy range. And you see here that thanks to the lar much larger collection area of, the, of, the, uh, of CTAO and already in these uh, um, intermediate configurations, so we can have uh, a factor uh, ten, uh, from 10 to 4 to 10 to 6 uh, improvement uh, with respect to, to, to Fermilat. So these are the science cases. So all the science cases, sorry, that, that would require these capabilities are those that should, in my opinion, be prioritized for the early, early science. If we move to the south, here you have the uh, same kind of plot. So in this case, you have the on-axis sensitivity here and the off-axis sensitivity here. So the off-axis is computed at 3 degrees from the, from the center. Of the, of the camera, so this is uh, something very critical and very important for the surveys. And uh, here you don't see, in this case, uh, the, the third generation of ICTs arrays because uh, this, uh, this is already uh, a large offset uh, for these generation of ICTs arrays. But uh, for uh, CTAO and this intermediate configuration, the, the uh, gamma ray field of view is already about uh, uh, larger than, uh, than five, six degrees. Sorry, I forgot to mention what is uh, this, uh, this uh, intermediate configuration looking like. You have it here. So we would have uh, uh, two LSTs, one MSTs, and 10 SSTs. So this layout uh, is, uh, is preliminary just to convey, but to convey the message that most likely we will start construction from one of the fourth of the, uh, of the array. We want to start from the north because the, the wind is blowing in this direction. So we don't want to... Uh, to create problems with the uh, to the to the telescope while digging, but the uh, and and the, and the fact that we want to have it in the uh, in this quarter is related to the power network. So for practical um, reasons, that's the the what we think at the moment is the best solution. But there is still room for uh, for changing ideas. There is still time, sorry, for changing ideas. The um, so the, the, now that I have described what we can have in 2027, let me tell you, you will be wondering, OK, so we, if we have data, CTAO data, and these, these are the performance of this data, how can we access and who, who will have access to this data? So the, um, it's not, unfortunately, I don't have the final uh, word, uh, the final answer to this question, so it's not yet decided uh, who will have access to the data during the construction. Uh, there are two clear principles that I want to mention. W the first one is that uh, we, there, should, there, there will be an incentive for the in-kind contributors and all the contributors to the construction project. And, uh, and the second principle is that uh, the broad community will be kept involved. I want to stress uh, from the very beginning, because that's very important from the CTAO perspective, that uh, during this phase uh, of the array de de uh, deployment, integration and commissioning uh, will have uh, the priority. But all the observing time available for science then will be distributed according to this uh, access policy for construction that has not been approved, agreed yet, but will follow these two uh, broad principles. The only thing we have uh, from the access point of view already agreed is what will happen in, uh, in operation phase. So once we have reached the, the completion of the alpha configuration. So this is a simplified version of, uh, of the, what the access policy uh, that we have uh, shows. So you have uh, two pie charts. Uh, so the external donuts that shows uh, the categories of uh, uh, observing time and internal pie chart that shows uh, the who, uh, who has access to these uh, observing time. So there is 20% uh, uh, host guarantee time that is given to the host countries or host organization. These arise from contractual obligation uh, with CTAO. So this is something that will be flat across the years. And, uh, and then uh, these, uh, these, uh, these percentage, that then we have the KSP time that are GTOs, so guaranteed time observations, as reward for the, um, 
for the contribution to the construction project that, uh, uh, that counts for 40% uh, over the first uh, uh, 10 years. And then we have almost uh, the same quantity of, of time for the, uh, what we call open time that, will be, uh, that can be requested by the users uh, through uh, calls for proposals. And then there is almost 3% of DDT, uh, DDT time. So the, I mentioned before the KSPs. The 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 KSP is is uh, KSP time is uh, is agreed to be 40% of the available time integrated over the first 10 years, but uh, the the profile of, is not flat for the first 10 years. The only thing that is uh, agreed so far is that for the first two years, basically the the entire available time once we have removed the whole Post guarantee time will be devoted to KSP. And after these two years, we will have a decreasing amount of KSP time every uh, call for proposal. So this, let's say, this part here and the blue part is for illustration purposes, is not decided, but just to convey the message that uh, the, the profile will not be uh, flat. Okay, I come, I come to the end just saying that uh, uh, another aspect for us is very, that is very important and was one of the main reasons behind the organization of this symposium was really to, to build bridges with the communities that are not uh, gamma ray astronauts to external communities. And, uh, and uh, uh, so our plan to continue on this goal is to organize a workshop on specific scientific topic. But another action that we are taking is to organize a science data challenge. The, the next year, so science data challenge is the release of, uh, of, the, uh, of high level data. Uh, as in the format as we expect, CTAO will deliver the data to his user together with the science analysis tool that, that CTAO again will deliver to his user to allow them to, to perform their, their analysis. So the, we will simulate uh, seven years of, uh, of data and we will release them end of uh, 2025, so the end of next year. This will be the first uh, open science data challenge where open means that anybody in the, in the, in the community will have access to this data. And this afternoon uh, we will release uh, the first year of data just uh, to the internal community, to the gamma ray community, uh, to the, the CTA or consortium as proof of concept, uh, as preparation for the Open Science Data Challenge. In this respect, I want to really thank all the, the, the huge work uh, that uh, effort uh, that uh, the uh, technical team of the Science Data Challenge uh, did. And we have uh, several people here with us, uh, Fabio uh, Pintore, Paolo, Stefano, but also Sabrina that, uh, that is far away and Kazuma. And, uh, and on top of these people, I think we need really to thank uh, the CTAO consortium uh, that with, we, with whom we work uh, together uh, uh, last year, uh, in the last years, to prepare the sky models that have been used as input for the, for the uh, data challenge. And here I want to show you just to give you an idea. So this is the GP, so the Galactic Plane Survey, when we combine HES and Veritas data. And uh, this is what we expect, uh, and we will be able to see if you analyze the uh, science data challenge data to, to see. So these, uh, these are the expected 500 sources uh, in the Galactic Plane. And I stop here. Thank you, Roberta. Questions? Yes, sorry, Mom. <laughs> Can you? Uh, um, it's not clear to me whether these are. PIs of instruments or people building the instruments themselves who have the right to have access to practice their, the entire time for the first two years? And how do you sell it to their external community? Because I think it can be dangerous, right, to have two years dedicated only so to... Thank you for the question. The, so 
First, I, an I answer the first question. So it's, uh, it's this time is granted to the countries. And then the countries uh, or uh, the contributing parties can also be organization, but the, these, these uh, contributing parties will pull together the time and uh, creating a scientific collaboration that will run the key SPs. And it's up to the country, uh, it's a country level to decide uh, which are the members of, uh, of this collaboration. To answer the second question, I, I agree with you that can be seen uh, as as a bad sign for the external community, but here the advantage is that uh, the key SP is really, it's, it's, we, we provide this data to these people as reward for their uh, contribution to the construction project, but in, in return, they will have uh, to provide the observatory with a set of uh, high-level data products that can be than used by the full community, the entire community, like for instance catalogs, uh, and they can serve as input for the preparation of the uh, standard proposals to be submitted during the open time. Another question there? Yeah, oh, uh, I, here, yeah. So thanks, Roberta. Um, just following up on this same question, what about the open time, the so-called open time? Uh, is there already a policy uh, on how this is going to be distributed, if it's going to be on merit? Or it's on full only on scientific merit. Okay, and then uh, it's, it's a posteriori, so every three years uh, we would need uh, to make the, the calculation, the computation of uh, who has had this, uh, which country has had this time, and then report it to the council, uh, and if there is a mismatch, uh, then we would uh, discuss uh, mitigation options. Okay, thank you. So, about the intermediate phase, so from here to the, when you will have your alpha configuration running under CTAU, um, as you said, there will be observations ongoing, and those will be more in the ends of the constructor, of the in-kind contributors, or more or less. So, isn't there any worries uh, from the other countries or communities within CTAO that the KSPs or part of the KSPs will be already scooped uh, during this time? Okay, so I didn't see that. that uh, so I said that the principle is uh, there will be an incentive for the IKC, but nothing is defined. So that's, that's the first uh, comment. Then uh, the, uh, the other comment is that uh, in, uh, in parallel, we will run a process uh, that will lead to the, open, the, to the call for KSPs. And, uh, and so this is something that will be uh, discussed, presented in, uh, in, the, in the next months, let's say. But, uh, um, but it's there uh, that we will take care, uh, so it's on how, I mean, we will take care not to spoil uh, the key SPs. So there will be a process, I cannot say much now, but there will be this, a process that will account for this. One last question. If not, I think we can thank Hubert again. And the next uh, speaker is going to be the consortium spokesperson, Werner Hoffman, who is going to give us uh, an overview of the scientific landscape. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vitor. Uh, this is supposed to be an outlook, uh, but let me actually start looking back a little bit where we come from and looking back as early as 2006 when CTA was conceived, this is a picture from a, a presentation to S3, and you see the array sort of looks almost like it looks today from the concept, three different telescope types, three different zones with energy thresholds which are actually close to what we have in mind now. So the concept hasn't changed much. However, what has evolved quite a bit is the scientific environment uh, in which CTA lives. It has evolved even since the 2017 2018 Science with CTA White Book. And let me quickly go through that, and of course you've heard it all. Uh, Multi-messenger astronomy has become a reality with gravitational waves, black hole mergers, neutron star mergers. Uh, there are neutrino sources, TXS and GZ10068. We see the Milky Way in neutrinos. 
GRBs have been detected in gamma rays, and there's this most remarkable, remarkable uh, lasso light curve showing how the environment becomes transparent for gamma rays, then flattening as the jet slows down, then while the beaming is still narrow, then the jet a decay and the jet break when the beaming finally gets wider uh, than the jet cone. So uh, really a, a wonderful and most remarkable achievement. And Arthur Lasso had also opened up the Pevatron sky uh, with this sky map showing uh, over 40 sources above 100 TV and showing uh, with Cygnus OB2 super Pevatrons which have multiple PV particles within uh, surrounding this OB association. Uh, and of course the rise of high altitude arrays in general has certainly impacted the field dramatically. So for CTO this is bad news and it's good news. It's bad news in a sense that some of these discoveries we hope to make with CTO. It's good news in a sense that the high energy sky got a lot richer opening up many new uh, opportunities and possibilities for CTO. So let's look at the future. Uh, we understand now that there's a complementarity between the arrays and the Cherenkov telescopes. The Cherenkov telescopes having a smaller field of view, a smaller duty cycle, but uh, a lower energy threshold, higher instantaneous sensitivity. They provide much sharper images. They provide better energy resolution. And so like any professional astronomer, uh, a photographer will have a wide-angle lens and a telephoto lens, I think, to explore gamma rays fully. You need these two instruments, and they complement each other. Uh, looking at the landscape, uh, the northern sky is pretty well covered. Uh, Lasso, the, the latest and, and most remarkable achievement. But what CTA will add there is by far the best observatory for extragalactic TV astronomy, and we'll come to that. The south so far is only covered by the 20-year-old HESS system, and CTA there will bring an order of magnitude boost at TV energies and will open up the PV energy sky. And of course, the great thing is that this is actually happening. This is a picture from La Palma where you see the one LST working and three more LSTs, uh, partly in already quite advanced construction stages, and Roberta told you about that. So let me touch briefly upon the big three science themes of CTA, cosmic particle acceleration, probing extreme environments, and physics frontiers, starting with cosmic particle acceleration. And you've already seen this picture of the Milky Way with about 500 sources discovered. Uh, and let me just point to one thing. Uh, we believe that still, at least in the TV domain, uh, supernova are sort of the default accelerator. Current instrument can resolve some of these supernova in the, uh, remnants. Two examples are shown here. But there are some very fundamental questions which are not decisively or almost not decisively answered. Namely, the simple question what we're seeing here is those leptonic and hadronic or hadronic gamma rays. And there, this ability to extract morphological information comes in. And there are two very nice papers recently by the Fukui team. Uh, what they did do is they compare the morphology observed in gamma rays with the morphology in X-rays and the morphology of target gas. And if the gamma rays are hydronic, they follow the target gas. If they're leptonic, they follow the X-rays. And the answer is not, maybe not surprisingly, that there's a mix. In 1713, about two-thirds are hydronic, one-third is leptonic. In RxJ 852, it's roughly 50-50. Now, these comparisons still suffer from the limited angular resolution, which doesn't follow all the details which show up in the, in the CO surveys of target gas. And I think there, CTA will make, CTAO will be able to make a big step forward. And we heard that one at, at multi-TV energies, one will be able to reach sub arc minute resolution, really matching the resolution obtained in CO surveys and opening up many more sources for morphological studies. Of course, what's unique uh, for CTA South is the view at the galactic center. This is a Mercat image, and you see uh, all these structures in there, all of which are correlated one way or another to, to non-thermal activities. Uh, and there's certainly a pevatron near the galactic center. Now, you can ask, how well is CTA actually doing regarding pevatrons? 
We've seen the LASO results. The red line here is the LASO sensitivity. The black dots are the CTA sensitivity. Uh, and clearly, uh, there's a bit of catching up to do. Now, you notice as these curves, if these curves rise linearly, it means we're in a photon-starved environment. We're just not collecting enough events. And these curves are for 50 hours of exposure. LASO is for one year. Now, the question is, how much exposure can we actually get on the galactic center? And actually, if you dedicate, it's quite easy to get in excess of 500 hours exposure on the galactic center in a single year. And if you look where CTA is with 500 hours, you're somewhere down here, quite competitive, even at the highest energies and much better uh, over wide energy range. Uh, so clearly, uh, this is a, a very interesting subject to do. Now, one can certainly do this only for a limited number of regions, but what you see here, I mean, this, this exciting galactic center region, you have to realize it's just a quarter of the field of view of CTA, and it will resolve all this area with sort of an arc minute resolution. I think this gives you a feeling of the, the, the things we can achieve with CTA. Uh, what actually morphology means for pevatrons, let's look at the one clear pevatron which we know, the Grab Nebula here is the LASO spectrum. Now, with current Cherenkov telescopes, you can actually measure the size of the Grab Nebula, and you find it's shrinking from about two arc minutes to about half an arc minute as the energy increase is shrinking towards the radius of the wind termination shock, matching the behaviors you see in X-rays. And of course, the explanation is quite simple. Particles, electrons are accelerated at, at the termination shock. They move away, they lose energy. So the highest energy gamma rays, the highest energy electrons come from close to the, uh, the wind termination shock. Now imagine, of course, for the grab, we know all this and we can actually put model curves in there. But imagine you had a pevatron which you don't know quite well and you're able to measure such a curve. It tells you a lot and this is Current instruments, CDA will do factors better in terms of resolution. Uh, and we're already seeing this with current instruments. These are magic blots on SNR G106, where you see that in the TV and the multi TV domain, the morphology of this object changes dramatically. So being able to extract this morphology, morphological information will be key uh, to really understanding uh, science, uh, cosmic accelerators. Another unique uh, object in the south is the Large Magellanic Cloud. Basically, we should not see any sources there right now. Yeah, I mean, because most of the sources we see with current instruments are within a few kiloparsecs of Earth. The Large Magellanic Cloud is 50 kiloparsecs away. Yet, if you look at it, even with current telescopes, you see gamma ray sources. Uh, you can zoom in on the source cluster, and it's sort of an elliptical source at the center is a pulse of a nebula. And if you subtract that, you end up with two additional sources, uh, R136 and 30 Dorado C. Both of these are, uh, one is a star cluster, the other one is a super bubble. And the current understanding is that star clusters and super bubbles are key towards understanding cosmic ray acceleration in the PV domain. Now, at this point, we're not able to do much more than detect these sources, but clearly CTA will resolve them much better and will trace them to higher energies. So lots of opportunities there. Now let me switch gears, come to probing extreme environments. We had a great review by Zara and Elisa. Here, to understand what happens around black holes and in the jets of black holes, really the GV and TV domain is key and CTA and, and variability is key. And CTA is excellent in hunting transients it provides unique coverage from tens of GV to TV, very high instantaneous sensitivity, 10 to the four times the collection area of Fermi, 300 times the sensitivity, fast repositioning, and this is illustrated already by the first LST1 results, where you, for example, resolve the BLAC light curve uh, on, on five minute time scales. Uh, again, here I should notice morphology may help for radio galaxies in case we see them sideways. Current instruments already resolve uh, a, an extended shape of the emission region and CTA will be able to do much better. Now, one key feature of course is that the universe is not transparent at cosmological scales. Uh, at Redshift 1, we basically see only in the LST domain up to a few hundred uh, GeV 
And so again, this provides a, a unique for CTA window onto the extragalactic universe. Now, uh, this, this attenuation edge here is both a curse and a blessing because it is, comes from, from uh, absorption on extragalactic background light and tracing this edge, one can measure the intensity of extragalactic background light. Quite interesting for cosmology. And one of the interesting results at this conference was uh, 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 notice that we can measure this, this extragalactic background light as a function of redshift much better than it was outlined in the first CTA publications. Uh, basically, can determine the level of extragalactic background as a function of redshift to a few percent up to redshift one. Uh, and again, that one is able to, to detect sources out to redshift one was wonderfully demonstrated by the LST1 uh, with the discovery of OP3103. What is important in terms of extragalactic astronomy is that we're going beyond the alpha configuration having LSTs on the southern side. This means CTA covers the full extragalactic sky. It's key for GRB and gravitational wave detection rates for AGN flare studies, but also to look for dark matter at the galactic center and to get wideband SEDs of galactic sources. So this is really a, a very important enhancement. Now let me skip forward to the, 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 the third big physics topic, uh, physics frontiers, with very nice reviews by, by Tim Linton and Gabriela. Uh, and of course, one of the key targets is the search for dark matter, for WIMP dark matter at the galactic center. <clears throat> you see here the current situation. Uh, the, the sort of holy grail is this thermal annihilation cross-section. And at low masses, below sort of a TV or up to a few hundred GV, this is already excluded by Fermi. At high energies, current instruments can sort of just touch this. And the important thing is that GV, uh, that CTAO, over uh, an order of magnitude covering the TV domain, will be able to probe WIMP annihilation uh, in this, uh, below this, this thermal annihilation cross-section. Now, uh, I should say a bit more about this. This is, of course, always related to the J factor, which is sort of the density of the dark matter at the galactic center. Uh, there were recently claims of seeing a Keplerian decline beyond 20 kiloparsecs of the Milky Way rotation curves. This would mean there's very little matter, luminous or dark, beyond 20 kiloparsecs. There's no dark matter halo. The mass of the Milky Way is revised down by a factor of five. And these papers also contained a statement that the J factor is lowered by a factor of seven compared to expectation, which would be rather detrimental to dark matter studies. But this is really related to the Inasto parameterization, which is used to describe the, the distribution of dark matter. If you make this distribution steep in the outer galaxy, it becomes flat in the inner galaxy. But it's really just the parameterization. I mean, there's no deep reason behind that. And I think. Uh, basically, what, what the important thing is the experimental test. So what this says is based on today's knowledge, detection of TV WIMPs is well within reach of CTO, if they exist, of course. Excluding them is hard, yeah, because if you don't see them, it can be J-factor and can be all kinds of things. But discovery is the thing to do. Now, if you discover them, of course, seeing them at one location in the galactic center will not be enough. We already have ununderstood excesses at GV in the galactic center. So the question is, what else can we do? Uh, Perseus probably is not quite good enough, contains a lot of dark matter, but it's not spiky enough to create large annihilation rates. The large Magellanic cloud has been studied, and actually, depending on configurations, this approaches this magic uh, uh, thermal annihilation limit. So this is certainly one possibility, and we've heard from Tim, about super dwarfs like those are major three, uh, which may offer uh, another handle. So there are possibilities to test a potential discovery. And of course, the smoking gun would be a line signal showing here a, a, a low intensity line superimposed on a background which CTO is able to resolve uh, using its excellent energy resolution in the TV domain. Uh, but again, this says CTO is a dark matter discovery machine. It's not an exclusion machine. Yeah, if you see it, you have it. If you don't see it, 
there are all kinds of explanations. Uh, we've also heard about, about, about very interesting new ideas about detection of light dark matter at the galactic center, uh, namely cosmic rays interacting with light dark matter particles generating gamma rays. At first glance, I thought this is a, a weird idea, but the point is if you have very light dark matter, there are lots of dark matter particles, uh, and there are lots of cosmic rays, and despite small cross-section, the, the uh, gamma ray production rate can be significant. So this is interesting in a, in a sense that it says there are new avenues opening up which we're just starting to explore. And we'll hear a lot more about, I think, in the, in the coming months. So I think it has become clear, and it's the, the main theme of this symposium, that CTA lives and thrives in the multi-wavelengths, multi-messenger world. We need all the coverage of the electromagnetic spectrum. Oops, something happened here. Okay, <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, of course, uh, there, there, there is supposed to be uh, a Fermi plot here showing the TV and TV coverage and raising the concern that this might disappear at some point. <laughs> Actually, it did disappear from the slide. Um, it, this was really not intentional. I just marked it with a red frame, which apparently made it disappear. But clearly, I mean, this turns to one of the big worries. This is a big gap. It was pointed out in previous talk. It needs to be filled. It's essential for our science. And of course, equally essential are interactions with neutrinos, with gravitational waves, with X-rays, optical, and radio. And we need this for target selection and target opportunities. We need it for object characterization. We need it to, might, to make wideband SEDs. And uh, by the way, the, the TO selection will become a challenge. It's OK for current instruments. But really, picking the right TOs, again, is something which relies on this multi-wavelength, multi-messenger environment. Now, beyond gamma rays, just two more slides. Uh, a word about intensity and affirmatory, we just heard about that. What caught me was this picture of a hypothetical exoplanet crossing the disk of Sirius, resolved with something like a Cherenkov telescope array equipped with intensity and affirmatory. And we just heard about, from, uh, about this great possibilities to track an expanding nova uh, with intensity and affirmatory. So I think these are really excellent and an excellent outlook. It's, and I, I very much hope that this can be realized at CTO. Now, let me switch gears completely. Uh, quite often when new wind turbines are being built somewhere, there are always people who argue against it because it kills a few trees and it kills a few birds. And I always find this rather short-sighted because the question is preventing a few trees and birds from being killed now or preventing many trees and bird species from being killed in the next decades. And unfortunately, we as astronomers are a little bit in a similar situation. Uh, there are papers by CTA colleagues, Jürgen and, and uh, Luigi and others, who've pointed out that the carbon footprint of astronomy is very large due to construction of infrastructures, due to flights, and so on. So we're really, really contributing significantly uh, to, to this, this problem, which may hit us in the next decades. Now, CTA is designed to last for 30 years or more. Uh, and I would just like to use this opportunity to ask all of you to contribute to society being able to afford astronomy in 30 years from now. Yeah, I mean, in a society which is struggling to survive, astronomers may become an endangered species, and we don't want that. Not only, of course, not just for astronomy, but also for astronomy. So really, keep this in mind and do whatever you can. Okay, on that, let me just conclude. I'd like to use this opportunity to thank all of you, uh, to thank in particular for this, the speakers, for excellent talks and posters, some of the best talks I heard in quite a while. I learned a lot. I'm, I'm sure you learned a lot. I'd like to thank all of you for the great interest in CTO science and for the fascinating outlooks 
at the science uh, that's ahead of us. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Werner. Questions? No questions? If not for the interest of time, since uh, we are very late, let's thank uh, Werner again. And then the director of uh, the observatory is going to close our session. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Theoretically, at least. See, they've been, they've been keeping the technical glitch to last, so I feel very special. Um, while that's coming up, I just wanted to say uh, it's a privilege to be able to um, end this symposium. As Werner was rightly saying, we've been learning a lot. I certainly have been learning a lot over the last few days, um, both in terms of the science that's been ongoing, um, but also in terms of the future in terms of how we can collaborate with other observatories, uh, how we can work with multi-wavelength, multi-messengers um, to create better science to increase the impact of CTAO, and how that leads us to a future. Um, Roberta did a great talk in terms of what that means for the project in real terms. And so I want to just take this opportunity to recap a little bit about that and then think about how do we convey this? How do we convey this change to all the stakeholders in the project? You know, there's us here in this room, there are people who are online, and there's a scientific community, there is a public community that's interested, but we need to convey what we're doing to our other stakeholders, such as our funding agencies. So the CTAO is grow. Ing, you can't see that there, and entering a new phase. Um, moving on, what does that really mean? Um, we've been building telescopes, prototypes, and pathfinders. Um, some of those are already deployed and creating great science. We've been completing remaining designs. There's a few still left, but a lot of it's been done. We're now starting to bring these you know, telescopes together, we're starting to build the infrastructure in the south, or will be at the end of the year. There's already a lot of infrastructure that's in the north. And we're beginning to build up the capability of the central organization um, to support of those key elements and to be able to support the in-kind contributors. And that all leads to these in-kind, sorry, these intermediate um, configurations. These configurations that, as Roberta showed, will be better than what we have now and will actually give us a glimpse into the future, into the um, potential of what we will have with the alpha configuration. In addition to giving us science, this will also facilitate the path to the alpha configuration. We will get lessons learned, engineering lessons learned, and then that will smooth the path. Now, I talk about a transition. Well, really, the transition is already uh, underway. Here you see the north site. It's an image that has been shown a few times during this um, conference, this symposium. Um, but it's worth showing it a few more times because it's great. Got the LST-1 up there on the left. Many of you were the ones who helped build that, who helped operate that. And that's been going successfully for several years now. But what um, people who have not been on the mountain recently may know or have seen is that there's three more LSTs going. And we've talked about this for a while, but what we see now is actual structures going up. And that's great, that things are becoming real and tangible. We will have an MST that um, will also be added to this in July of 25. We will have other structure that will be put in here because we already have the expansion that is underway. Now, 
as Roberta said, it's a very nice desert. Um, we have a road. It used to be, as people would joke, that it was a road to nowhere. Well, we're going to change that. At the end of this year, we are putting contracts in for um, the electrical system, the earthing grid, and most importantly, for the foundations. For foundations for those telescopes that are currently under development, that will be delivered, and we will give them a place to live. And therefore, this road will be going to something that is great. It will be going to that intermediate configuration that Roberta talked about. Now, I always like to use the phrase that we build a scientific machine. We bring a, build a science machine. We take photons, we turn them into bits, and that allows us to take those bits and turn it into science. So obviously, it's not just about the hardware. It's about the software, the software that controls these telescopes and then actually takes that information and does the science data processing, archiving, and as well as the um, access for us all to get our hands on that data, on those data products. And so here you see the first real-life test of ACADA, of the Ray Control and Data Acquisition System on LST1 with our LST1 um, colleagues. Very successful. And from out of that, we had a critical design review earlier this year. It's this sort of development that really helps us move along. We're further behind on DPP, DPPS and SUS, um, but we're getting there. And we're staffing up more to make those things move forward more quickly. Software, if it has to live somewhere, the project software will eventually live here. This is the SDMC in Zeuthen, just outside of Berlin. Lovely site if you haven't been there already. Um, it is being built. This is a picture from just a few days ago. It will be completed in September, and there is an inauguration in October. In addition to DESI personnel who are involved in this project, there will be 33 um, people from CTAO, from the central organization, who will be housed here as well. And we will be roughly doubling um, the capability, the staff complement of the people as we move into this year. Now, this is a little bit closer to where we are um, currently. This is the Bologna headquarters, just a little bit north of here on the um, ENEF facility. It's the home for the project administration, for systems engineering, a um, few other specialized domain engineering and administration in addition to science. We will add approximately 20 people by the end of the year to bolster this. We are chronically understaffed. We are fixing that. We have the budget to fix that, and we will increase the budget going forward to make this a better project. I'm a visual person, so here's a picture of the staff. And some people have changed, but that's OK. Imagine that picture, twice the staff, twice the size. That's what we will have by the end of the year. Doing these um, essential disciplines, like I say, the systems engineering, growing the team on the sites, not just at the SDMC and other headquarters. We need to put people on the ground, software, administration, project management, and science. Key things that we need to do. So we're growing as a project not just in one particular area, but on all fronts. And that means we've got a new phase, and that we will be going towards science, the reason why we're here. As Werner mentioned last night at the dinner, CTAO was formed 18 years ago, or the concept was 18 years ago. It's been too long. We need to do something now to actually give us as scientists, um, basically the return that we want to have for all those years of effort. We need to convey that to the stakeholders, as I mentioned at the beginning. We need to make it so that people know that we have this change, that we are not just doing telescopes anymore. We're doing a raise that actually gets us what we want. So. We were thinking, how do we do that? Whoops. Sorry. Now that's a cheat, yeah. 
you know, it, I'm going to blame this rather than me. So we thought, how do we convey what that means? Um, we can talk to people. You have to do that. You know, we can have conferences. You have to do that. Yeah. But sometimes it's the visual aspect. As I said, I'm a visual person. And you have to get that across. And so we had focus groups. We talked to several people in the audience here in terms of what we should do. And we realized we needed something that was clean, that was easily recognizable, and also something that was unique. And unique and also related to the physics. And one of the things that seemed pretty obvious, or maybe not obvious, but obvious in you know, um, hindsight, who would think about building an array for something that you can't actually get through the atmosphere? The radiation from an astrophysics source that actually doesn't get to the ground. That's what we do. We build telescopes that see the flash, the interaction of the atmosphere with that radiation. We build telescopes, Cherenkov telescopes, that see that flash of light. And so that should be something that inspired us. And that's exactly what we did. So here you see that beautiful blow of a particle shower as it enters the atmosphere that then goes on and gets captured by a telescope. And that leads us to our new brand, CTAO, with that blue, and obviously the Cherenkov in there. We have it so that, whoops, I do like it, but I didn't really want to replay it. We have it so that it has sort of different color contrasts. This is the main image because it um, works well on different, um, different sort of contrast levels. And I'm going to talk about the different elements that's in this and why they're there. So first, this star-like thing in the middle here. Well, that's exactly what it's trying to convey. Um, a star is the most recognizable astrophysical um, object that people know about. The blue is because it's Cherenkov light. It's housed within the A because that's the form of a shower. So that's what we wanted to convey, that we had the light that comes from the shape of a shower. But the truth is, we don't really observe stars primarily. What we observe is the effect of the stars, the effect of the things that come out of the stars on the environment around them. And so what we did is that we looked at something like a jet. And we have this negative line that goes through some of the characters. And that's meant to symbolize um, more the sort of objects that we look at. And so what we did here is we called out, essentially, CTAO. That's recognizable. The blue of the unique thing that we try to actually look at, and the type of object that we try to look at, and we do it in something that is a simple way, that on any form, on a template, on a slide, something you go, yes, I know what that is. Now, logos are nice, um, but you need to convey the message in multiple ways. You need new colors, you need new fonts, we've developed that, and you also need new channels. So one of the things that we've updated is the website. And you can go out there and see you know, the new information, um, new videos, new graphics. Um, we've delineated it between what is aimed at the public, and there is a science section um, for you know, more technical and scientific detail. We also simplified the URL so that it's ctao.org, something that people can more easily remember. It's also important to have a naming structure. As I said, although I'm a visual person, obviously we write things down. We wanted to get rid of CTA to go to CTAO to convey that notion of observatory. And so we wanted to say, look, we've got north sites, we've got south sites. That's what brings the observatory together. We also have many people. As Roberta said, you know, we're only going to get to our ambitious goals if we operate as a team. 
not as groups, not as individuals. And so we will all operate under that umbrella of a single project. And so that's the thing that we wanted to convey. And so along those lines, we wanted to have this naming structure be flexible, but also be something that you all could use. We have what I refer to the central organization, but we also have CTO consortium. I mean, this, a lot of this should not be new in terms of the form of it. It builds on what it already exists out there. And we have LST, MST, SST, ACADA, and so on, because anything for it to be useful needs to actually adapt to what we need it to do. We can't be beholden to something that just because we've created it is not what we want. But enough of me talking. I just before I leave you, just wanted to say, we need to convey this. We need to bring this across. We are going to be doing great things, building on the good things that we've already done. And I think we need to realize that although we all know what we're talking about, we need to be able to simplify that somewhat. We need to convey that to the larger world. And we also need to convey that we all have different opinions, and that's great. You know, As academics, we thrive off of those different opinions. That's how you get better intellectual discourse. But we need to convey to the world that we are one team. And that's what this is about. But enough of me talking. So with that, I bring this symposium to a close. Um, and this is the second symposium, and I look forward to more, three, four, and ongoing as we begin to talk about real data. Thank you.